Hello, fourth graders. My name is Colin, and I'm the Education Associate at the Nooksack Salmon Enhancement Association. I hope you've been having a lot of fun learning about salmon, but for this part of your field trip, we're going to be taking a closer look at a different part of the food web. It's a very important part of the food web that salmon need to survive. We call this group of very important and diverse little critters macroinvertebrates. Let's take a look at what that word means. Macro means big, but you may notice later on that these creatures are pretty small. It's just that Macro is the opposite of micro, which you'd have to use a microscope to see, and because we can see these creatures with our naked eyes, we call them macro. Then we have the final part of their name, invertebrate. If you take your hand and reach behind your head like this, you might be able to feel a bump there. That is your top vertebra, and these creatures don't have it. In fact, they don't have a spine at all. They have a skeleton on the outside of their bodies called an exoskeleton. That is why we call them invertebrates, and why we belong to the part of the animal kingdom called vertebrates. They eat all kinds of dead things, like the dead bodies of adult salmon that have already reproduced. They also eat leaves that fall off of trees, all kinds of organic matter, and each other. To catch macroinvertebrates, we used a net called the D-net, and we used a special technique called the salmon dance. Let's take a walk over to the river so I can show you how it's done. We shake our body like a salmon, and that kicks up sticks and rocks and mud from the riverbank, which then flows downstream into the net, along with any macroinvertebrates that might be hiding there. Now that we've captured some macroinvertebrates from the river, it's time that we identify them so that we can learn more about this ecosystem. It's important to keep in mind that these little critters need to be underwater to survive. So we're gonna put our macroinvertebrates into a magnifying box that we fill with water to keep them happy and safe. We're gonna use a super scientific tool to catch our macroinvertebrates for examination today, the science scooper, otherwise known as a spoon. Now that we're ready to identify this little bug, let's discover how we identify a macroinvertebrate. Here, we have a key to identifying macros called a dichotomous key. This key shows all of the different traits of macroinvertebrates, like shells, legs, and wings. All you have to do is start at the top of the key and answer the questions on the way down based on your observations. The first question is, does it have a shell? This one doesn't have a shell like a snail would, so I'm gonna go over to the no shell section. The second question is, does it have legs or no legs? And this macroinvertebrate definitely has legs. So let's go over here to the leg section. The third question is, how many legs does it have? Does it have 10 plus pairs of legs, four pairs of legs, or three pairs of legs? And this one has three pairs of legs. The next question is whether or not our macroinvertebrate has wings. And this one definitely doesn't have wings. So I'll go over here to where it says no wings. And here we go. Does it have no obvious tail? One or two tails or three tails? And our macroinvertebrate today has two tails. So I think it's over here in this section. And that makes it a lot easier to narrow down which one our macroinvertebrate is. To me, it looks like our first macroinvertebrate is a stonefly. Good catch. Let's identify another one. We're gonna use a different type of key to identify this macroinvertebrate. To me, it looks like we have a mayfly nymph. It sort of looks like this one. Its head is pretty wide. It has six legs and three tails. It also matches the size description right here. Let's catch one more macroinvertebrate. This one is a little easier to see. It's a lot bigger. And it's also really fast. There we go. It looks like I got it. Okay. We're gonna use the other side of that same key that we just used to identify the last macroinvertebrate. To me, this one looks like a water boatman. It has a distinctive beetle-like shape and long arms that look like oars. Also, I'm noticing that it doesn't swim on its back like a back swimmer, which is pretty similar, but definitely a different species. Just like most organisms, macroinvertebrates are sensitive to pollution. When there's pollution in the water like poop or heavy metals, some macroinvertebrates can't survive. Scientists like you and me have spent a long time figuring out which macroinvertebrates are more sensitive to pollution, which means that we can see how much pollution there is in the river today based on which macroinvertebrates we catch. Macroinvertebrates can be divided into three groups based on how much pollution they can tolerate in the water system. Group one macroinvertebrates are very sensitive and they can't survive if there's almost any pollution at all. Group two macroinvertebrates can survive if there's a little bit of pollution in the water, 
And group three macroinvertebrates are very hardy and can survive even if there's a lot of pollution in the river. Knowing how much pollution there is in the water is an important part of knowing whether or not the water here is cold, clean, and clear enough for salmon in the Nooksack River to survive. This is a macroinvertebrate pollution tolerance index, and it shows which macroinvertebrates are in which pollution tolerance group. The first macroinvertebrate that we caught was a stonefly, and it looks like a stonefly is in group one. The second macroinvertebrate that we caught was a mayfly, and that's also in group one. The third macroinvertebrate that we caught was a water boatman, and that's all the way down in group three. Now that you know that we have two macroinvertebrates from group one and one macroinvertebrate from group three, take some time to think about a conclusion. Do you think that the levels of pollution in the Nooksack River are excellent, fair, or poor for salmon? Based on the macroinvertebrates that we caught today, I think that the levels of pollution here are pretty low which means that the water quality here is excellent for salmon. We have two species of macroinvertebrates that are from group one, and if they can survive here, that means that the levels of pollution for the salmon are pretty low, which gives us an excellent rating. Thank you for joining us at the macroinvertebrate station, and enjoy the rest of your virtual field trip. Bye fourth graders.